So, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're continuing the adventure, Lunar Phases. Huge shout out to the amazing author. Check out their details in the description below if you want to follow along. In this session, we'll be exploring chapters 4 to 6. Don't forget to smash that like button and drop a comment. Your engagement helps us out with the algorithm and means the world to us. All right, let's jump into the story. Crawls for those who watch it and springs ahead on the unwary. It was a chaotic order, an abstract concept turned concrete fact. Time was a measurement and an element all on its own. Mortals, for all their wishes, could not wield its power and few immortals were able to manage it. The Greek pantheon had a pseudo-god of time, which was actually a moniker for the father of titans, so his mention or invocation was often ignored by Olympus. Often the concept of time when applied to mortals brought the Olympians great frustration. December 23, 2007 The night prior was festive and fun for all on Olympus, save a select few. Apollo had masked his disappointment and disapproval well from his fellow gods, and kept the masses from harassing Artemis. She, her son, and her hunters excluded themselves to her temple for a good portion of the night, likely to grieve their lost sister. The demigods, likewise, remained clustered together. Talia Grace and Annabeth Chase took playful jabs at one another's makeover, while Percy Jackson and the brave satyr Grover Underwood made conversation with partygoers. When the time came for the demigods to return to camp, Artemis volunteered to take her rescuers back. She entrusted her son to her twin, along with a sternly worded warning should he somehow misplace the boy again. And after a quiet moment between mother and son and a friendly exchange with the demigods, not to mention the slightly lingering hug between his little nephew and the daughter of Zeus, they left. Apollo kept him along at his side for the remainder of the evening until it came time for his ride in the chariot to start. After setting course for the standard flight path, the god took his mortal nephew to a small cafe in Times Square for breakfast, one he and Hermes often frequented whenever their daily paths would cross. He spoke through most of their meal, an easy feat given that all he ordered was a black cup of coffee and watched the boy across from him. You just had to make a deal with an Egyptian. Apollo lamented for the upteenth time and scowled at the advertisements for coke that Dionysus had been pushing through his departments. Couldn't have been one of the minor gods like like Janus, Hymen, or my ace. For the last time, Uncle Fred, the whiskered teen beside him sighed. Kansu approached me, and you shouldn't have acknowledged him. The god snapped. A golden brow arched on the youth's face, significantly showing off his unimpressed look at the god's anger, a reaction similar to what his twin would do. The thought made Apollo cool off, and he rubbed his hand over his face, slouching in his seat. Sorry, I just, if I'd known you were going to, I hate the limitations set upon my domain. It's such crap. Uncle, Naruto drawled. I was banished from the camp in Olympus. Not interactions. Yet. That's the key word. Yet. Apollo scoffed. All the big guy has to do is find you and Talia Grace canoodling in a Camaro. We're friends, uncle. The boy cut him off with a roll of his eyes. Apollo scoffed at his words. The tension between his nephew and Zeus' latest little girl was higher than the tension between Athena and Poseidon. Naruto finished the last bite of the eggs Benedict he'd ordered and pointed at the god with the fork. Besides, neither of us even owns a Camaro. You mean, neither of you own a Camaro yet? Apollo grinned. He just had a brilliant idea, one that gave him a glimpse into a few possible futures, all of which would make him beam with pride. The second jumpstart to the boy's hormones was all he needed to get him on the track of truth and righteousness. Come to think of it, you're overdue for a 16th birthday present. What say we swing by used car lot? And no thanks. The god scowled at the dismissal. Naruto propped his head up in his hand. The other lifted and ticked off a finger. One, most muscle cars are gas-guzzling monstrosities that aren't doing the planet any favors. Two, I don't have a driver's permit, let alone a license. Well, that's easily fixed. The god snapped his fingers and a plastic ID card depicting the teen's face in a cold stare appeared in front of him. You're welcome. I'm not using this. Naruto, I'm a god giving you a gift. Accept it. He ordered, before grinning. Besides, I already know you will use it because I've seen it happen. For what? Getting a ticket? Spoilers. The face he received from the boy was far too unamused for his liking. Relax, I've taught you just fine. You should pass any test. Apollo then shrugged and interlaced his hands behind his head. Or if you really want to, you could just go without. Look at me. I've been driving for millennia. No license necessary. It's a miracle the world hasn't gone up in flames yet. You joke, but seriously, kid. I'm the best driver on Olympus. Apollo leaned back and crossed his arms, frowning in thought. Hermes only has me beat in official marks because I'm not allowed to use my actual ride in our races. That, and I'm pretty sure he always gets Hephaestus to mess with my backups. Oh. Naruto mumbled as his attention shifted. His eyes were drifting towards a raucous group of teens near his age. 
Though hopeful that it was for a reason his twin wouldn't approve of, Apollo watched with an increasing feeling of dread as the teen's emotive blue eyes started to harden and grow cold. For a split second, he thought he saw a brief flash of red. He chanced to glance at the group and, oh crap, they were harassing the waitress. Don't even. Apollo turned back to find a seat across from him empty. He scowled. He should have been able to keep tabs on the mortal at all times. How did the kid always manage to do that? All right, Artemis raised him. The thought made Apollo scowl. He never admitted it aloud, but she was always so much better at hiding than he was at seeking. He needed to get her to key him into her nifty tracking device so that his slippery little nephew wouldn't disappear again. Apollo whipped his attention back around to the table of ruffians when someone let out a yell. He winced and grimaced before paling as a series of crashes started to make patrons duck for cover. The god groaned and clapped his hand onto his face. I'm going to have to erase so many memories. January 8, 2008. Nardo didn't stay in New York long after the year changed. After celebrating the new year with his mother and the hunt in Central Park, Uncle Fred took him back to his old apartment in Pennsylvania. Or he tried to. The God of the Sun was horrified to find the building condemned and abandoned and frantically set about searching for a new home for him. He settled on renting a room at a hotel in Jersey City. It's temporary, Uncle Fred assured him once he dropped his bag on the bed. Give me a few weeks and I'll have something set up for you. Weeks. Naruto arched a brow, mildly surprised at the admission. He didn't really care how long it took, but to have a god say something as mundane as setting him up in an apartment would take more than a day was a bit odd. It would be faster, but Hermes is on his half-day schedule to recover from and prepare for the holidays. What holiday does he have to prepare for? Come on, lil' nephew, don't act like you never celebrated Valen, right? Uncle Fred sighed at the annoyed look that crossed Naruto's face. The god closed his eyes, pinched the bridge of his nose, tilted his head forward and muttered something under his breath before looking back at him. Look, just just don't do anything stupid like leaving without telling me, okay? Oko. Okay. I mean it, Naruto. Okay. Naruto held his hands up to placate his, justifiably, upset uncle. As soon as I get a disposable phone. What? Oh no. Nope, not happening. Uncle Fred grabbed his arm, guiding him to the door. Come on, we're getting you on the family plan and a RAZR today. It had been two days since, and Naruto's poorly stocked supplies were running low. Not unusual, since he preferred to live off the land, but being in the heart of Jersey City, the chances of that happening were slim to none. That meant it was time to hit the grocery store and use his dwindling stipend to top off the fridge. I should get a job. Naruto muttered to himself as he walked into the hotel lobby. He was getting sick of sitting around and waiting for anything about school from Uncle Fred, or his mother, or even Hermes himself. Checking the mail every morning, staring at his phone, watching TV, and rereading the same five comics could only entertain him for so long. We could always go find someone to kill. Yeah, we're definitely not going to do that. Naruto deadpanned. Ever since he left New York, his tag-along had become quite vocal. He stepped out to the January chill and shivered. He popped his hood up and zipped up his jacket. Come on, fuzzball, there's got to be something you like to eat. I gorge myself on human flesh. Oh. Naruto drawled, pulling his Christmas gift from his mother closer around his face. A practical and warm scarf to replace the one he'd lost on the quest to save her. He felt an unnatural fury start to grow in the back of his neck and sighed. Work with me here. What do you like to eat that won't make me a cannibal? Why do you care what others think? The way I see it, we have the power. The fox chuckled. We can do whatever we want. Great theory, but let me put this in a way that you can understand, Naruto said, stopping at a curb and glaring at nothing in particular. I would sooner have Zeus atomize me than eat another human being, alive or not. TCH killjoy. The fox grumbled. A beat passed before it growled. Fine, get noodles and broth. You have to give me more than that. The chance that he'd get the wrong noodles and screw their slowly growing dynamic up were too high. You're familiar with it, I'm sure. Those of your bloodline are addicted to blast. What's it called? That mean? Ramen. Naruto paused and subtly licked his lips. He liked the food ever since Uncle Fred had taken him to a small stand in Japan. His mother had put a magical limit on his body's possible intake of the meal after he gorged himself into a food coma with 17 instant meal cups when he was nine. Maybe that spell had worn off by now. Something to consider. It's cheap, full of sodium, but manageable in our current living situation. Nearest store is a few blocks east, I think. Good. Then onward. We have a feast to prepare. Fox. This might be the start of a wonderful partnership. The longer you dawdle, the more likely I am to start eating your soul. Point taken. Naruto deadpanned and hurried himself along. Hugh Man was arguably the most unlucky human in America. How did he know and say this with such certainty? For starters, his name was a pun. 
He flunked out of college because his alarm clocks always seemed to go on the fritz. His car was stolen and recovered absolutely trash the day before Christmas. And at the top of the list of cruel irony, his girlfriend left him for someone named Esther on New Year's Eve. If any gods out there exist, why do you hate me? Hugh asked the cosmos this often. Usually, it was met with silence. Sometimes, he could have sworn there was something laughing. Despite them, Hugh was determined to avoid being depressed by any legal means available to him. Consequently, he was such a diligent worker that he's been employee of the month at his job for five months straight. He was so good at managing his finances that his landlord, Mr. Frisk, had just given him a break on rent for a month. Most recently at a garage sale near his parents' home, he found and restored a fully functional scooter that got him from A to B at no cost to the environment. That was last weekend. And this week, we're going to keep turning the year around. Hugh thought to himself as the bell chimed. He straightened up behind his register and smiled at another customer that walked in, mouth opening to give them the traditional slogan greeting that seemed to be all the rage nowadays. Before Hugh could get the words out, he met the gaze of the hooded guy that entered. Cold blue eyes glanced out from beneath the gray NYC hoodie, while a thick white scarf covered the lower half of his face. His hands were tucked into his stained jacket's pockets, making the guy's broad frame appear just a bit bigger. His sneakers were covered in snow, and his jeans were partially frozen, giving off the appearance of someone who had just hiked from the other side of the state. Hugh faltered. Where's the ramen? Hugh almost jumped at the muffled timber. When had he gotten up to the counter? Oh God, he had a piercing in his ear. Oh, great, he was getting flashbacks from junior high. Damn you, Parker Peterson. That swirly ruined his and Janice's budding romance. No focus. Can't change the past. Focus on the present. Hugh snapped himself from his thoughts and pointed at aisle four. Third shelf from the top, just before the hot dog buns. Cups or bags? Um, but? Thank you. The teen headed for the aisle in question, and Hugh made note to keep an eye on him. Then the bell rang. He prepared for another greeting, but the new customer was not a customer at all. Huey, the greasy-haired man in a green Adidas tracksuit. He had a single chain around his neck, and attached to it was a cross. Behind him were two larger men who emulated his style. Both wore the same green Adidas tracksuit with white A shirts underneath. One was bald, the other was not, and both were growing more hair on their chest than on their heads. Mr. Castiglione, Hugh swallowed, recognizing the man from his auto shop's online adverts. According to a few of his former classmates in his shop class, Castiglione was rumored to have been a made man in the 90s, fled New York during the mass convictions in 1999, and had since built his own little family in Jersey. But those were just rumors. Sure, he came to the store on the first Friday of every month, but that was just a coincidence, right? The owner and manager, Mr. Good, would usually speak with him in the back, but he had called in sick today. This guy. Mr. Castiglione looked at the two other guys with a grin before he leaned on the counter. It is the second Friday of the month, and you are just the guy I wanted to speak to. I was worried it'd be that new guy. What's his face? The guy that doesn't know anything. Y you mean Joel? Joel hadn't been seen since Friday. Yes, him. He's an idiot. Mr. Castiglione laughed at his own joke before grinning at Hugh. He felt like he was thrown in the middle of the lion's cage at the zoo. Mr. Castiglione drummed his fingers on the counter before pointing at Hugh. But you, you're no dummy, eh? Uh, no, sir. Uh, Mr. Castiglione grinned. He pushed away from the counter and said something to his friends in another language. Italian? No, Hugh couldn't assume. Assuming only made things worse. Mr. Castiglione turned back to him, grinning. I need my money this week. Money? Hugh blinked. Yeah, you know. The green stuff we use to buy your shit? I need my cut this week. Call it an interest paid in advance. Mr. Castiglione smiled. I, I don't. Hugh swallowed. I, I can't do that, sir. Mr. Castiglione stopped smiling. He looked at his bald friend and flicked his hand toward the door. Hugh watched bald guy go to the door and flip the store hours sign around. Mr. Castiglione sighed, drawing his attention back. Oh, Huey, tell you what. I like you. He pulled something from his pocket and dropped it on the counter with a loud clatter. Hugh stared at it. He'd never seen a gun up close before. Here's what's going to happen. My friend Jonesy, the big guy with hair cracked his knuckles, is going to break your fingers. If I don't get my money after he breaks your fingers, I'm going to shoot you in the leg. Deal. Um, excuse me. Is there a self-checkout or do I have to wait in this line? Hugh, Mr. Castiglione, Johnsy, and the bald guy all looked at hooded ramen guy. In his hands, filling two shopping baskets, were no less than 30 packages and 15 cups of ramen. H. Who the heck are you? Mr. Castiglione asked. Hooded ramen guy blinked and lifted his baskets. A paying customer. 
He lowered his baskets and tilted his head. Oh, who are you? The annoying reoccurring criminal stereotype, the sympathetic and sad criminal stereotype, or the so inept tits funny criminal stereotype. Mr. Castiglione turned beet red. John C. snapped this loser's neck. Hugh gasped and ducked down behind the counter to hide from the coming violence, only brave enough to peek over the edge. John C. reached out to grab Hooded Ramen Guy by his jacket collar, and at the same time Hooded Ramen Guy dropped his baskets to the ground. Hooded Ramen Guy grabbed the offending arm in both hands, jumped up, and dug his feet into John C.'s stomach. John C. stumbled back and slammed back first into the counter, while Hooded Ramen Guy hit the ground. He rolled his legs up over his head and kicked up to his feet, arms raised at the ready for a fight like he had been studying Kung Fu all his life. John C., cradling his stomach with one arm, pulled a revolver from his side with the other and cocked the hammer. Hooded Ramen Guy disarmed him with swift roundhouse kick, then with the same leg, kicked John C. in the jaw, ribs, and ended it with a jump spin kick that knocked him over the counter into the cigarette rack. The heck kind of Kung Fu bull hockey is that? Mr. Castiglione asked, the bald guy staring incredulously at Hooded Ramen Guy. Hooded Ramen Guy glanced at them and shrugged. I'm enthusiastic about my hobbies. You smug little son of a... Mr. Castiglione reached for the gun he'd set on the counter. Hooded Ramen Guy cut him off with a swift punch to the throat. Mr. Castiglione choked on his own words and stumbled back, tripping over the five-hour energy display that took most of the early morning to put up. Mr. Castiglione wheezed and gagged, floundering around to look at Bald Guy. Bald Guy looked at Hooded Ramen Guy, then at Mr. Castiglione at Hooded Ramen Guy, at the place where John C. landed, then at Hooded Ramen Guy once more. Then, without warning, he held his hands up, shook his head, and ran out of the store. He's smart. Hooded Ramen Guy grumbled as he walked over to the counter. He grabbed Mr. Castiglione's gun off the countertop and turned towards the not-as-scary businessman. His weapon-free hand balled into a fist, and he tightened his grip on the gun. You're not. HRLGK. Looks like I was wrong on all accounts. You're the stupid criminal stereotype. Pity. He cracked his neck and stalked towards him. A slow, measured gait, like a wolf or a tiger stalking its prey. Those guys usually don't make it to a hospital. He may or may not have wet himself after that line. KLGH. KRLGH, Mr. Castiglione wheezed, rubbed at his neck and scrambled away from him. Hooded Ramen Guy tilted his head and let out a contemplative hum as he watched the man falter to push open the pull-only door. Fair point. He flipped the gun around to hold it by the barrel. But he said he wanted to break fingers, so let's start there. What followed was a beating that Hugh would never forget for the rest of his life. By the time Hooded Ramen Guy finished, Mr. Castiglione's face looked like an uncooked slab of ground beef, and his fingers looked more like limp noodles than appendages. Dark red splotches stained Mr. Castiglione's jumpsuit, and the crotch portion of his pants had become darker in color. After he was done, Hooded Ramen Guy pulled the magazine from the gun and dropped both in the trash can by the exit. Calmly, he walked back over to the baskets he dropped, gathered the ramen packets that fell out, and put them back in. After picking both baskets up, he walked up to the counter and looked at Hugh. Can I help you? I'd like to buy these. He set the baskets on the counter. Hugh looked at him, stared more likely. Hooded Ramen Guy stared back, his eyes not cold or angry. Just impassive. Take them. I'm not stealing. I'm buying them. Hugh yelped when his eyes flickered red for a second, before going back to blue. Hooded Ramen Guy blinked a few times. Saudi, can you just ring me out before the police show up? I need to get home before my uncle comes looking for me. Police. You did call them, right? While Hugh stared blankly, Hooded Ramen Guy sighed. The silent alarm should have been tripped as soon as the gun hit the counter. Silent alarm? Hugh blinked and then crouched down to look under the counter. Sure enough, there was a button under the counter. He pressed it, stood back up, and then started ringing up Hooded Ramen Guy's ramen. After cashing out the total, he gave Hooded Ramen Guy his receipt. Have a good day. Hugh smiled. Hooded Ramen Guy snorted. Funny. Yes, it was. Um, what? Take care. Hooded Ramen Guy left the store, being sure to step on Mr. Castiglione's gut as he left. Hugh leaned on the counter and waved at his back. He smiled and blinked a few times, then slumped back in a dead faint. Cook faster. I can't make water boil. Naruto sighed as he leaned against the wall and half-watched the pot on the electric stove out of the corner of his eye. The rest of his attention was dedicated to the television in the main room. The news on the screen, but the volume muted. He tilted his head as he read the caption. Hooded assailant puts local businessman in hospital. Weird, that's not how I remember it. It's boiling. Hurry, add the noodles. No, it's not and we'd still have three minutes. You are evil. I knew I liked you. Much more than that red-haired bitch. What? Naruto looked at the skull on his arm sharply. It was the image the fox liked to speak to him through the most. He frowned when it grumbled something unintelligible under its breath 
and kept its gaze averted. He looked back at the pot and crossed his arms. Fine, be stubborn. Three loud knocks came at the door. Naruto wasn't expecting anyone, which probably meant either local law enforcement were at the door, or a god was visiting him. Rare, but knowing his luck, not unheard of. It wasn't Uncle Fred, he didn't knock, he just entered, usually loudly and with obnoxious fanfare. His mother would have made him come outside. Kansa would have just appeared in the room. It's open, come on in, he called. If they were a god, they would stay outside until he opened the door for them. If they were law enforcement, they would do the same because of legal ramifications. If it was something else, they would come in. In all scenarios, he could focus on what he was doing and pretend they weren't there, and the slim chance that they go away might come to fruition. His eyes went back to the pot, and he didn't fight the smile from spreading across his face when steam started to rise from it. Good news, Fox. The water's ready. Yes. The door, and half of the hotel room with it, exploded with bullets. The television ate a good dozen, the bed ate twice as much. Naruto himself was struck at least once in each limb. The only place where he wasn't hit were the vitals in his chest. Worst of all, the pot was knocked off the stove by stray gunfire, and the freshly boiled water spilled all across the floor. No. The fox snarled. They must die. You know what? Naruto felt the fox's energy bubble and healed the damage to his body and got up off the ground once the shooting stopped. He sat up, glaring daggers at the various goons in tracksuits that he could see through the bullet holes in the wall. He reached up to the earring cuff on his left ear and pinched it. In a flash of white light, his axe from Ares appeared and he brandished it. For once, we agree. Naruto got to his feet, charged the shot-up door and barreled through its shoulder first, shoving the gunman on the other side into the opposite hotel room's door. The gunman, the same bald man who'd escaped the general store assault earlier, screamed as the doorknob drove into his back. Naruto's left arm hefted his axe up and brought it down to split the screaming gunman's skull. He pried his axe from the dead man and let his body slump to the ground, a trail of red marring the pristine white hallway. Seven more tracksuits stood in the hall, five of them frantically reloading archaic guns. Naruto narrowed his eyes. Their features shifted as they grew to eight feet in height and became larger in size. Men and ogres. Naruto frowned. I'm not sure which is worse. Who cares what they are? Rip them to shreds. Don't have to tell me twice. Naruto threw himself at the next man with a primal yell. His weight brought the large criminal thug to the ground and he lifted his axe up. A gunshot rang out and his raised arm felt lighter. Looking up, he saw a hole and two fingers missing, the shot not only tearing them off but also knocking the hatchet out of his grasp. He glared at the shooter before looking down at the man he tackled. He grimaced as his fingers and hand grew back, but balled them into a fist and drove it through the man's face and the floor beneath it. Naruto stared, dumbfounded at what he'd just done to a human skull. You're welcome. The fox grumbled. Now kill the rest. Holy crap. Did you see that? Kill that freak. And an ogre shouted. For Polly, Naruto was tackled off of the mash-faced corpse by an ogre and carried through the ruined wall back into his hotel room and driven back first into the folding closet door. Instead of flailing to get out, he wrapped one arm around the back of his assailant's head and grabbed under the monster's arm with the other. A tight pull on his part was followed by a jerk and a loud crunch. He rose to his feet as the dust fluttered away. Blue eyes glared at the others staring at him in the hallway. Rip. Them. Apart. His hand raised. The axe he was disarmed of earlier flew through the neck of one ogre, ridding it of the ten-pound weight that sat between its shoulders and landed in his outstretched hand. He closed his eyes, rolled his neck and let his red eyes snap open. Gladly. Chaos ensued. January 9th, 2008. I'll admit it, I hadn't expected to find you here of all places. A bearded blonde man with a crooked chin chuckled as he stared at the teen sitting in a holding cell. He was glad his young ward hadn't stopped practicing his combat skills. When worthy attack on a hotel reached his ears, he set out to learn more about it and bring some much needed peace to the community. He was surprised to see the boy get put into a police car and taken away. The lad was a fine warrior and word had spread of the injustice done to him by the Olympian's all-father. The series of misfortunes must be consequences of some Greek curse bestowed upon him. Seeing as he was all but fending for himself, Frere decided to post his bond and make him an offer. Nice to see you too, Elf. Naruto drawled, his arms crossed. Frere chuckled and tucked his hands into his pockets. Do you greet every god with such glib in your words? Only those I like. Despite their surroundings, Frere barked out a laugh. He ignored the mortal law officers that stared at him oddly and walked through the bars that contained his wayward student as if they were liquid. The men would forget what they saw before it even registered. He sat down beside the younger blonde and rested his arms on his knees. Before I get to my purpose for finding you, I must apologize for my abrupt departure. There was something I had to be present for, and I know that when I did so, I left you vulnerable. 
Fry looked at the boy's arm. His train of thought derailed and he glanced warily at the boy. Care to explain why you proudly display the images of Hattie and Skull? Apparently I died. No Valkyrie would mark you with those images, boy. They didn't. After you vanished, I was attacked by a giant fox that was hiding between the realms and used runes to stop it. Those runes appeared on my arm. Naruto gestured to the markings that still resemble the Norse-written language on his form. A month ago, I was shot, bled out and died. They cut me a deal, brought me back, and afterwards the skin on my arm burnt off. It reformed with these two on it. Interesting. Frere mused, rubbing his bearded chin. Does it use their images to speak to you? Skull's image is its favorite. Oh, mockery. Figures a fox would go for that. Frere nodded. He sighed. I'm afraid you've been marked by Fenrir. Because of course I was. Naruto groaned and let his head fall back to rest against the railings. His right hand lifted and rubbed his temples. I just wanted to shut it up for a little bit. You could have just eaten the bodies, boy. Frere snapped his eyes down to the skull image. He narrowed his eyes. Skulls did the same. So the beast speaks. And screw you too, blondie. Don't pick a fight I can't win. The teen glared at his arm and then scowled at Frere. What do you mean Fenrir marked me? Hattie and Skull are to be the ones to eat Soul and Mani when Ragnarok comes, and are the children of Fenrir. Their pursuit of their quarry is too much for them to turn away and give mortals any attention, which rules them out as the cause for this mark, Frere said, his arms crossed in thought. The Fenris wolf may have marked you as a potential pawn or as prey. That overgrown mutt proves no threat to me, the fox assured with a growl. Frere stroked his beard again. Perhaps. He admitted. Many times, a cunning wolf has been outwitted by a lucky fox. The one who knows best of Fenrir, outside of Loki and Odin, would be Tyr. Lucky me. Another god of war. Naruto drawled. Freyr flicked the side of his head. Oh. Pay your respects to the one that gave you the bone steel axe. Ares gave me this axe. Did he? Freyr arched a brow. And the son of Zeus is known for giving powerful weapons away? Well, no, but... And the Olympians are known for making weapons that return at will. Poseidon's. And the blood of their enemies often empowers their weapons? Okay, you've made your point. Naruto relented with a frown. Maybe it wasn't Ares. But if it was Tyr, why not show himself to me? We don't like to stick our noses in the business of others if we don't have to. Frere shrugged. And Tyr has always been a strange one. He willingly stuck his hand in the Fenris wolf's jaws and became a minor god of war when Thor started to show better promise over the domain. That's, I have no words. Naruto mumbled, brow furrowed in thought. Frere grinned and clapped a hand on his shoulder. Then let's have enough of this glumness. You appear in a bit of trouble. Want me to help you out for old times' sake? Just tell me what you want, Elf. The boy sighed. Frere chuckled again. Sorry, lad. Sometimes I forget that you've dealt with more immortals than most mortals recognize. Onto my original purpose for seeking you out, Frere said, getting to his feet and sticking his hands in his pockets. There's an opening available at a hotel in Boston I know of. Paid living, food meals. And the insurance is immeasurable. I think you'd be perfect for the position. Hold on. Back up. Naruto lifted a hand and raised an eyebrow at him. You're telling me that you came here to a mortal police station to offer me a job? I was going to offer it to you regardless of where you were. Frere shrugged. The mortal gained a pensive look on his face before meeting the god's eyes again. What would I be doing? You'd be a lifeguard. That's it. The disbelief made Frere frown. A challenging brow arched. What was the rodeo clown position filled? Of course, you'd bring that up, Frere sighed. I apologize for that already, haven't I? Laughing, yeah. Naruto scowled. Not for actually signing me up to be one without telling me. It worked out in your favor, didn't it? Yeah, I couldn't use my left leg for a week. Great times, Naruto grumbled. Frere sheepishly rubbed the back of his neck. He may have had his sister help speed along the boy's healing with magic. Could be worse, I guess. It could have felt like my insides were burning from the inside out. I didn't hear you complaining when I restarted your heart. Cold Blues glanced at the artistic representation of Skull. You're not involved in this conversation, Fox. I feel pretty involved whenever you take a shot at me for reviving you. The beast huffed. Be glad my comments have been mostly kept to myself, human. Selene, Helios, Cthulhu, and Primus. Naruto pinched the bridge of his nose and scowled. Frere did his best not to chuckle at the invocation. That one addition always made up for the other because of its ridiculousness. Alas, he needed an answer before the other immortals watching the boy sought him out. Well, lad, what do you say? Sure. Fine. Whatever. Naruto sighed, dropping his hand to his lap. Oh, I just need to make a call first. January 10th, 2008. Sorry I missed your call, lil' nephew. I was in a very important meeting. 
The words died on Apollo's lips as he appeared in the middle of his nephew's hotel room. Bullet holes, bloodstains, and chalk outlines marred the hotel floor. The television was knocked down and had a numbered card in front of it. Apollo took all of this in and nodded. Okay, okay, don't panic. Maybe that's what his phone call was about. The god pulled his cell phone out and listened to the last message. Got a job in Boston. Sorry about the hotel room. Later, Uncle Fred, that boy is maddeningly unhelpful when it matters. Apollo mumbled, staring at his phone incredulously. One word stuck out to him, and he gaped. Oh, Boston. Did he say Boston? He tried calling his nephew back immediately and started pacing when every call sent him to voicemail. Come on, nerdo, pick up the damn phone. Uh, why do you have to make things so difficult for your Uncle Fred? All you had to do was sit tight for a few weeks. Ark, why doesn't he just listen to him? Mid-step, he almost tripped over something. Looking down, he found a silver circlet under his sandal. He picked it up, stared at it for a moment, and then paled drastically, to the point that his flawless skin lost its subtle golden hue. I lost him again, he mumbled. The circlet dropped to the ground with a clatter, and he slumped against the wall, rubbing his face with a groan. Artemis is going to mount my head on her temple wall. Rage. It was a chemically induced reaction that caused mortals to lash out, to seek to harm others. It was a passionate feeling in the sense that it blinded the feeler to everything around them. This emotion prone to bloodlust inducing phenomena was favored by Ares explicitly, but other gods of Olympus were not unfamiliar with it. January 12, 2008. Artemis has only felt true rage a few times in her long life. Her first brush with true rage came about during the incident with Actaeon. Just thinking of the lust-driven man now, millennia after his death, made her eye-core boil and her fletching fingers twitch. After that was the event that took her first lieutenant from her, an act she's never forgiven her father for. More recently, the audacity committed by Atlas and Luke Castellan. Trapping her in such a blatant way, with such obvious bait, would follow her as one of the most humiliating events of her immortal life. Killing yet another of her friends in front of her only made the memory hurt that much more. It drove her to fight harder that day and work her hunters to their immortal bones. At least Bianca seemed to be managing just fine in her new role as lieutenant for now. Yet, that incensed feeling paled in comparison to what she currently felt toward her twin. There hadn't even yet been a word invented in any known language that could express what she felt. What do you mean you lost him again? Artemis snarled, taking one step closer to her brother. Apollo had one job she trusted him with outside of his Olympian duties, and she barely trusted him to perform those with any sort of professionalism keep just one of his amazingly awesome all-seeing eyes he so greatly loved to brag about on Naruto. She'd lost a dear friend due to her own fault already and from what she'd understood, nearly lost him on the same quest. Her twin had earned a second chance at being her son's legal guardian from his granted support against Atlas and at the winter solstice meeting, and in less than a month he'd squandered it. Artemis really shouldn't have been as surprised as she was. Her twin brother was an unparalleled idiot and were it not for her son's mortal blood, she'd sometimes thought Hermes, the annoying, slippery little fool, was Naruto's father. The boy took to her lessons in hiding and stealth like a fish to water. And now that he was without his enchanted circlet, her head started to pound. Apollo holds still. Artemis lifted her hands as her power shone through her eyes. I'm going to strangle you, stuff your body, and mount you outside of my temple as a warning for the rest of Olympus. I have an idea of where he is. Apollo quickly backed up, keeping her more than an arm's length away. The goddess let her hands fall and narrowed her eyes. Then tell me, and I shall go fetch him myself. Uh, about that, Apollo swallowed. The hesitation did not fill her with confidence for her son's safety. His next words only confirmed those fears. Oh, I need an oath on the sticks that you won't freak out first. You. The audacious request did very little to dissuade her from making good on her declaration. Apollo quickly flashed away to the other side of her temple. Artemis, I'm serious. He pointed at her. I'm not saying another word until I hear you swear it. Fine. She snapped. I swear in the sticks that I will not freak out over whatever news you give me of Naruto's location. Thunder boomed and Artemis' glare became cold. Now tell me where my son is, Apollo. Boston. A beat passed. Artemis stared at her twin, Jagape. The throbbing in her head started up again, tenfold. Boston. He got a job in Boston. Apollo shrugged then looked away and rubbed his neck. After his hotel room was shot up by some mortal mafia men, Artemis could only make a small sound of disbelief as her head felt ready to split in half. Come on, sis, he's your kid. Apollo grinned, but she saw the weak falter in his eyes. He's handled us easily and lived on his own for practically a decade now. I'm sure he's fine. What happened after that failed attempt at reassurance, Artemis could not say for she had completely blacked out. 
It wasn't often that the twins interacted in mixed personas. Roman and Greek split personalities usually didn't mesh well. Take the Civil War, for example. That was a mess on its own without the gods saying it. Not to mention their already rocky sibling relationship took on drastic new elements whenever one as a Greek would interact with another as a Roman. Whenever the Roman aspect of Apollo interacted with Artemis, he greatly aggravated her, and he knew it. More often than not, Phoebus Apollo got his Greek counterpart in trouble just for the laughs. The same could not be said of the inverted pair, for surprisingly Diana was more forgiving of the Greek Apollo's antics. This was mostly because she attributed his foolishness to his being born in a barbaric land and during an unenlightened era. However, there was one topic where Diana was somehow more attentive than Artemis was, and that was whenever the subject of her adopted son came up. Diana, more often than not, would be the aspect to pick and choose what days Apollo could whisk the boy away for some cultural lessons. She also had the tendency to be more actively protective of him. The first time Apollo had lost track of the boy, he awoke after a week of riding bitch to Phoebus panicked flight from their twins' Roman fury. He'd awoken, face down in the middle of a crater, sir all over, and had to seek out Asclepius for help. The only positive to come out of that whole incident was that he was accredited for New Rome's new public pool. Now, there was probably little chance of him emerging from the coming punishment of Victor in any way, shape, or form. Apollo. The cool, stern voice that left the goddess' lips made the god of the sun backpedal toward her temple's door. Diana. Hey, cease. Long time, no see. I was just about to get a head start on scoping out Boston. His back hit something solid. Strange, he could have sworn there was an entryway there. His eyes widened in horrified realization. It would seem that fleeing was no longer an option. But groveling still is. Apollo's sense of self-preservation screamed at him. Diana, please. Apollo pleaded, still trying to pass through the solid wall behind him as the Romans stalked forward. We already know he knew Freyr. Let's just ask father. A calloused pair of pale fingers pressed his lips together with a firm grip. Jupiter will not save you from the punishment that is to come, Graces. Diana's silver eyes glowed. You swore on the checks. Artemis was the one who swore to show you leniency. I have not. Apollo felt his eye core freeze as Diana smirked. She released his face and snapped her fingers. The temple opened once more. But, given our shared parentage, I will be fair and give you an eight-second head start. Better yet, if you can find Naruto before my hunters, I will even spare your life. Sariusvi, cease. That was a dark joke, even for Diana. Zeus, let alone Jupiter, wouldn't let the sun god die so swiftly. Then again, the lone rational portion of Apollo's brain noted he's already in super paranoid mode because of what happened to Artemis last winter and Talia Grace's exposure to Egyptian magic. 1. Apollo sprinted to his chariot so fast. He may have very well turned into particles of light. He'd barely turned over the engine when the first arrow smashed through the windshield and hit the upholstery in the back. Oh, come on, Diana. Apollo scowled as he fixed the damage to his ride and tried to think of an appropriate disguise for it. That is so not okay. Leave my chick magnet out of it. The next arrow that smashed through the windshield managed to clip a few golden hairs off of his head and stab into the headrest above his right ear. With his astounding sight, Apollo stared at the goddess who'd yet to leave her temple. Diana's cold silver gaze had little hint of forgiveness in it, and dare he say it resembled the look she had on her face after she dealt with that jackhole like Tian. She drew another arrow and pulled back on the string. Instantly, trillions of possible futures started flooding into Apollo's head, giving him a small migraine. There were not many where this next shot of hers ended well for him. Survival instincts overrode his enormous pride, and he floored it. He had to find his nephew before his twin actually killed him. January 14, 2008. Well, that's problematic. Naruto stared at the massive gate that was chained and padlocked shut by the city, judging by the closed notice hanging from the lock. A historical placard made of bronze-tinted steel was screwed into the brick beside it, explaining the history of the eight-story brick mansion that apparently hid from the more preternaturally unaware a hotel. The teen scowled and looked down at the dead cell phone in his hand. He'd attempted to call Alf once he got here, but his battery was dead. Given that his apartment was attacked by the tracksuit mafia, putting the JCPD's holding cell for a night, and traveling down the East Coast by foot, Alf had insisted upon it so he could finalize some details with a hotel. He shouldn't have been too surprised. It was still irritating all the same. Uncle Fred probably broke the voicemail by now. Naruto thought with a snort as he pocketed his phone. His uncle was probably going to be upset that he left the apartment, but he really had no one to blame but himself. He might not have been a demigod, but he wasn't known for his vast attention span either. He crossed his arms and glared at the lock again. Just hop the gate, boy. The fox snarled, adding lowly under his breath. Sage, preserve me from this simpleton stupidity. You're in a mood. Naruto mused 
filing the softer comment away is something to ask about later, and looked around. The last thing he needed was to be busted by a local cop for breaking and entering. Seeing none in sight, a given it was Monday, he jumped up and grabbed the top of the gate. With the strength and agility that most professional gymnasts would envy, Naruto pulled himself over the iron gate and landed with hardly a sound. It was only upon his landing did his comment get a response from his grumbling companion. I'm only in a mood because you've been gawking at that stupid gay for 10 minutes. That can't be the only reason. Well, it is. And people call gods petty. Naruto mumbled as he walked up to the giant wooden doors bearing iron. He grabbed one of the wolf head door knockers and used it to its design before waiting and waiting. Ten minutes passed and a raven cawed behind him. Naruto glanced at the tree where the bird sat. Ethereal green eyes stared back from the bird's head. Well, that's only extremely unsettling. He turned to face the raven fully. I don't know if you're Hugin or Munin, but regardless, you can get Odin to open this door for me, right? I'm here for the lifeguard job. The raven tilted its head and scrutinized him anew for another moment. Without prompting, it took off to the sky and disappeared behind the manor. He stared at its last known location and pinched the bridge of his nose. Why did I think that would work? It wasn't a terrible idea. The fox snorted. Except for the whole bird part of it. I hate birds. They're loud and annoying. You're definitely going through something. Naruto sighed as he started rubbing his head. Before he could consider what to do next, there was a soft creak at the door behind him. He let his hand fall and arched a brow. That's convenient. Think it's a trap? Could be. It wouldn't be too surprising. Gonna spring it? Probably. It was the only way to get into the building. Gonna eat whoever set it up. We've gone over this, Fox. His eyes rolled. That was an argument they shared over the course of their trip to Boston. Particularly whenever they stumbled across any way were hikers. The fox would make a snide comment, then suggest eating them, and Naruto would refuse. Right, right. The fox huffed. Gonna kill whoever set it up. I'm going to speak with them. If it gets violent, it gets violent. I'll take what I can get. Naruto shook his head and went to the door. He barely nudged it open when an otherworldly force took hold of the front of his shirt. He planted his feet and tightened his grip on the rim of the doors, scowling at the dark interior. The wood splintered in his grasp, and he felt something beneath his feet give. Yes, it's a trap. Oh, these guys are so dead now. I hate magic. Naruto grumbled before he was pulled in, and the door slammed shut behind him. Two blue eyes glared at the knock upon her office door. Gunilla. A muffled voice called from the other side. You're needed in the foyer. Gunilla Thor's daughter, Captain of Odin's Valkyries, Thane of Valhalla. All around badass extraordinaire, groaned in frustration. Not twenty minutes prior, she had explicitly requested not being bothered while going over reports from her Valkyries. There were so many potential souls to fight for Valhalla, and so many more reports to go through. Normally, it was Odin's job to determine who would be welcomed in the heroic Mead Hall and who would go to Freya's land, Folkvanger, but the Allfather was away, on one of his many wandering trips. That left the sorting of souls to the Valkyrie captain, and while she would happily vote for their placement within Hotel Valhalla as one of the Thanes, Ganilla's eyes were starting to cross from going over 400 reports in the past hour. There were thousands more yet still to be read. It wouldn't be half as bad if there was an order to it. Resigned to dealing with a mess before her later, Gunilla rose from her desk and opened her office door. She glared at the Valkyrie that stood before her, a girl of 17 years with dark hair and green eyes. I had explicitly requested not to be disturbed, Irene. She growled. Yes, I know, but they're the mortal in the foyer. Whoever brought them in shall submit their report as the others do. Ganilla drawled, only for Irene to cut her off. It's the boy that was with Nightshade. What? Thor's daughter blinked. Irene repeated herself and Ganilla stared at her for another minute more. Slowly, a smirk spread across her face and she crossed her arms. Well, who was the one to bring him in? She'd have to push to get them something nice. A spa brochure or something. He entered alone and Irene hesitated. Alive? Beg pardon? He's still alive. Gunilla's arms fell to her sides and her smirk fell into a scowl. She twisted her arms and a maul of bone steel appeared in one hand while a sword of the same make appeared in the other. Then let us remedy that. Alf is dead to me. Naruto caught the blade of yet another burly teenage boy wearing a green Hotel Valhalla shirt and floral swim trunks with the underside of his axe. His open hand lashed out like a pit viper's and he struck the boy's throat. While he choked on air, Naruto used his stomach as a stepping stone, walking up his physique to launch himself over to the front desk, where his target watched with a sneer on his face. This all came about because the concierge, who was apparently a rule stickler in the worst way, couldn't accept that a clear-sighted mortal had been brought into Hotel Valhalla Live. He knew the Norse and their ilk took the word stubborn and stretched the meaning of the word to new levels, but this was getting ridiculous. 
If you are not worthy, we will make you worthy. Another armed teenager roared as she tackled him out of the air. Naruto hit the ground with a grunt, but kicked the girl away. He got back to his feet in time for a series of thumps to catch his attention. He looked around with a frown on his face. There were suddenly a lot of armored girls around him. One in particular stood out above the others, both literally and figuratively. By estimation, she was near his age, but built with more muscle than he had. Her hair a paler hue of blonde compared to his vibrant gold, and her eyes thunderous blues like that of his half-blooded friend. It's almost as if that female you were courting buffed up, took a flat iron pan to the face, covered herself in hammers, and then poorly dyed her hair. The fox snorted. It took all of Naruto's willpower not to laugh aloud at the images that conjured up. That was made an easy task when one word stood out amongst the rest. He glared sharply at his arm. What do you mean, courting? Were you not? Was it just to be a blast? The bitch had her own term for this. The fox grumbled. The word eludes me. Look alive, the Oni is speaking. Mortal, the girl said with a scowl, her voice echoing over the copious jeering and drawing his attention once more. You trespass on sacred ground. You will have one chance to explain yourself. I'm here for the lifeguard position, he said. He looked around at the dumbfounded stairs sent his way and shrugged. If it's already been filled, I'll just leave. Who sent you? The girl asked, frowning. Frere. Describe him. Hawkish nose, blonde hair, crooked chin. You forgot a sneaky bastard. The fox pointed out. Naruto ignored him. Oh. The girl willed away her weapons and crossed her arms before looking him over. You were dead not a month prior to today. I saw it. How did you survive? Magic. He brandished his marked forearm for a moment before tucking it away. Is that so? She asked. He nodded. Her eyes narrowed suspiciously. We shall see what the Thanes think. Thanes. Naruto frowned, unfamiliar with the term. The ruling council slash board of the hotel, she explained, gesturing for him to follow. He did, slipping his axe back to its earring form and placing it back on his left ear. The Valkyrie kept speaking as he followed her. Lord Odin has the final say, but when the Thanes rule something, it often goes over smoothly. Oh. Naruto was half listening, focused on the pelt-covered, armored lass in front of him. What was with a female's hip sway? Why did it always draw his eye? Stupid hormones. Alf will be forgiven for everything he put the mortal through if he just do away with the accursed chemical changes going on in Naruto's brain. Uh, and I thought the red-headed bitch's hormonal years with that blonde idiot were bad. The fox grumbled. I can only imagine what your younger years were like. Okay. One. Who is this poor woman you keep referencing, and what did she ever do to you? Two. They weren't, and still aren't, over fast enough. Were you listening? The Valkyrie asked, standing in front of a large set of double doors. When they get here, when had she turn around? How long had he not been paying attention? Mortal, stop staring at my face. Stupid friggin' hormones. And here I was thinking you were the blonde idiot's child. The fox snorted. Clearly, you got his looks alone. Sorry, I zone out a lot when I'm not fighting. You're a terrible liar. What was your name again? Naruto asked in an attempt to change the subject. The girl smirked and crossed her arms. Brave of you to ask after staring at my arse. She leaned in a bit towards him. Then again, most lacked the stones to ask for it at all. Amazon alarms were blaring in his head. I suddenly have the feeling I'm not going to like working here. Shame. As far as I'm concerned, you're hired. The Valkyrie said with a small smile. He leaned back from her. How in the world was he supposed to respond to that? Her smile cracked a bit more, and her shoulders gave a slight tremor as she leaned back. Let's just hope the rest of the Thanes agree. Be a waste to have you killed and sent to the Janunga Gap. Bless you. You have by coming here. The Valkyrie smirked and tapped his nose, making him go cross-eyed while he spluttered. Don't fret, mortal, tis but some fun. You're too young for my taste. Her smirk fell with her next words as a look of grave seriousness followed. Cute as you are, I'll still kill you if you were to do anything to advance the coming of Ragnarok. Oh, I'm starting to like this one. The fox chuckled while Naruto faltered for words while his hormones waged rebellion in his mind against his greater ego. He would not let this back and forth end with him being made the fool by a technicality. I'm not cute. He growled. What? No. Stupid hormone addled brain. Focus. You're right. Oh. She agreed. You're adorable. What? Like a kitten. What? The fox burst into laughter. I? You. Naruto settled for glaring daggers at the girl, who smiled at him and patted his cheek condescendingly. He knocked her hand away as he felt his blood boil. You're a feisty one. You may just last longer than the last lifeguard. That was a red flag. The Valkyrie turned and put her hands on the door behind her. 
a mighty shove and the doors creaked open before the Valkyrie turned back to him. The name is Ganilla Thor's daughter, mortal. Welcome to Hotel Valhalla. January 20th, 2008. Naruto quickly found out that a lifeguard was not Hotel Valhalla's version of a pool safety official. No, the lifeguard was essentially the primary target in a widespread game of killer. Only in this game, the masses used actual weapons in an attempt to kill one individual. The reason the hotel hired outside help to act as lifeguards was to evaluate the heroes of the modern age and the skills of the heroes within the hotel. Not to mention, it was a moot point to use an already chosen occupant in a hotel where the legitimate occupants could never die. Yeah, fun fact he learned in his first hour on the job, the hotel's occupants, called Einherjar, were resurrected upon their deaths. He nearly had a panic attack after one axe-happy, Viking-looking teenager. You got a hell of a swing, mortal. Name's half-born Gunderson, he'd introduce himself later, attempted to blindside him, and literally lost his head and hands for his troubles. Gunilla was kind enough to enforce a timeout to explain that to him. An hour later, she tried to crush his skull with her maul while he was preoccupied with looking for a bathroom. At that moment, Naruto didn't regret decapitating her. That was a week prior. It was day eight and Naruto still remained alive. The only times he could rest were during the breaks for meals and combat practice. The second was the only one he was allowed to observe, but not participate in. There have been several close calls. Members of the 64th floor had attempted to drop a slab of limestone on him no less than four hours after his game started. Halfborn and his fellows from the 19th floor dogged him endlessly on the second day. Gunilla would make a daily challenge to him in single combat. Thus far, it had only happened in the most inopportune times. Other Einerjar utilized pathetically generic schemes in an attempt to kill him, I, numbers. It had only nearly worked the first time, when he hadn't been aware of their resurrection abilities. At the moment, Naruto was curled up in a storage closet on the 104th floor, attempting to catch some sleep. He was almost surprised by a literal bomb in his supplied bedroom on the 19th floor, warned only by the faint smell of gunpowder and the fox's astute senses. For the past three days, he'd been too paranoid to stay in one place for too long and move floors every six to seven hours. A creak in the floorboard outside the storage closet's door made him crack his eyes open. He tightened his grip on the handle of his axe. Soft whispering made him control his breathing. Could be busted for this. Oh, you should be focused on the life. I won't work with a blast. Ill intent. The fox rumbled. Not aimed at us. Naruto closed his eyes, but continued to listen. The voices bickered for a moment longer before wood broke and a scream rang out. Metal clashed for several seconds and grunts sounded beneath it. The familiar sound of non-consensual bloodletting signaled the end of the conflict. Curiosity getting the best of him, Naruto slunk over to the door and peered through the keyhole. A lone figure wearing a green shawl around their head panted as they pulled their weapon from the back of another Einherjar that lay on the floor. Their back was to the door. Flapping wings were heard and they gasped. Quickly, she stumbled back and reached for the door handle. Scared. The fox salivated. They always taste better when they're scared. We are not eating. Corpses. Spoil sport. They're coming in. What? Naruto threw himself away from the door as it flung open and quickly shut. The figure leaned on the other side and pressed their ear to the door. More flapping sounded before the figure sighed and made to open the door. Honed reflexes were the only reason Naruto's head lacked an axe protruding from it. His hand still bled as it tightened around the Arabic girl's axe. She was a young thing, definitely not much older than Annabeth, but the look in her eyes spoke of a maturity most didn't have. Lifeguard. She mumbled. She looked at the axe he still held and pulled it. He ignored the sting as he kept it in place. The girl frowned at him. I seek no conflict with you, lifeguard. Perhaps not, he uttered. But those Einherjar may think otherwise. Those Einherjar are driven by the beliefs they died with. The girl mumbled, almost sourly. She sighed. Please release my axe. I swear on my family name that I mean you no harm. I'm here to report and then go home. That's all. Home. Naruto frowned as he released her axe's blade. The fox healed his wounds and she slid her weapon back over her shoulder before looking at him again. I'm like you. His brow furrowed for a moment before it clicked. She wasn't a nine herji. Looking her over, he noticed her armor resembled a more modernized version of Ganilla's, and her shawl was actually a hijab considering how it tucked tightly around her face. You're alive. Yes. The girl nodded. Samria alabas. You're an Arabic Valkyrie? He asked. She hesitated, and he sighed before he crossed his arms. Listen, if it makes you feel better, my name is Naruto. Not lifeguard. Oh. Samria blinked. That's unexpected. Naruto smirked when she nodded. I get that a lot. Want to tell me why those Einherjar were gunning for you? 
It's because I'm the daughter of Loki. Really? Naruto felt his eyebrows shoot to his hairline. Really? She nodded. He leaned back and considered how much that had to suck. The girl leaned against the door. Can I ask you something now? Is it about me being in the closet? I don't care what your sexual preferences are. I'm going to pretend you didn't just say that. Naruto pinched the bridge of his nose while the fox roared with laughter. What's your real question? How are you still alive? Magic. Really? Samria blinked. That's the gist of it. He shrugged. Don't you have a report to make? Yeah. I don't think Ganilla is going to be happy with it though. Ganilla gives you a hard time? I'm a daughter of Loki. She's a daughter of Thor. Samria shrugged. Marvel didn't just make that rivalry famous for the heck of it. No kidding. Naruto mumbled, recalling his uncle's rants against the gods in question whenever he tried to get him invested in cartoons by binge-watching them. And at least, attempting to. They usually just put him to sleep. Except for one time where a Spider-Man cartoon featured the lizard. He was up for a whole night, afraid about being caught off guard by the nightmare-inducing madman known as Kirk Connors. Naruto shook the thought from his mind and sought desperately to distract himself from it. So, it's that bad that you two were pulled into it? Mm? Oh no. She was hoping to use her similarity to make a foundation of friendship so that you would reveal your abilities. Huh. We've noticed how lenient you get in fights whenever you have to interact with younger girls. I don't. I'm not. Don't worry. I think it's an unconscious psychological thing, Samria shrugged. I told her I'd try, but that we probably wouldn't get anywhere. And I was right. You're maddeningly unhelpful. All praise to my uncle in that regard. Naruto deadpanned. Then she decided to just use me as a distraction to catch you off guard. Samria continued. I figure it fair to warn you that she's waiting with a good dozen Valkyrie to come in and attack us while we're talking. What? Loki and Thor. Samria shrugged. The hint of a smirk played at her features. Personally, I'm rooting for you. Gunilla is a jerk. Ill and tin inbound. Code red. Code red. Thanks. Uh, mind. Naruto nodded to the side. Samria stepped to the side, allowing him to run out of the door and leave one of the weirdest exchanges of his life. Although that could have been attributed to his sleep deprivation. March 12, 2008. Bodies of Einherjar and Valkyrie alike littered the foyer. They were wholly unprepared for the carnage that came early that morning. Explosions riddled the dining hall, disrupting the morning meal, and rune stones across the hotel fell inert as safety precautions activated. All save for the master stone, Odin's personal key, which had been stolen from his quarters. The culprit of these atrocities? A very unhappy employee. Why? Well, you? D. Gunilla huffed with every slash she made at the blonde lifeguard. Her target caught her stab through the palm of his hand and drove his foot into her gut. She stumbled back and glared at the boy, facing her. His body was leaner and muscles more pronounced due to the slight malnourishment he suffered. His hair had grown to a shaggy length, and peach fuzz grew on his jaw, chin, and the side of his mouth. His shirt was the only article of clothing that lacked any damage, despite the many attempts made on his life. The skin exposed by his torn jeans was littered with scars, a fate his arms and right eye shared. She'd acquired his original right eye in their ninth duel, and witnessed his incredible regenerative gift firsthand. That trophy was pickled in a jar and would rest on her desk until Ragnarok came. I told you. His voice was scratchy and dry. I tried that already. It was boring. The lifeguard cut his own words short to turn and catch Mallory Keane in the skull with his axe. He jumped up and over her head, his axe dislodged and caused the daughter of Frigg to stumble into Ganilla's way. The blood spray blinded the daughter of Thor, leaving her open to another assault that knocked her to the ground. Through bleary eyes, she stared at the lean figure that stood over her. So I stood back up. He turned his back on her and limped toward the main doors. Another Einherjar flew at the lifeguard, only to be caught by a swinging log. One of many traps that was set up before the main attack and further dwindled their numbers and crushed into a wall. The blonde lifeguard put his hand on the door and turned back to her. He pointed at her with his axe. In case it wasn't clear, he said through gritted teeth. I quit. You win. Game. Over. Kodash Ganilla scowled at him. Coward. I'm not a mortal. He roared, rounding on her. I'm not Einherjar. This was just a job. I quit that job. You don't like it. Tough. That's how life works. You want something, and it's ripped away from you, so you have to adapt. Deal with it, fool. The game won't end. She huffed and pushed herself to her feet. Until you die. Really? He asked, scowling. She nodded. His eyes narrowed. He held his hands out to his sides. Then come and kill me, Thor's daughter. Ganilla managed one step before she found herself without a leg. She toppled ungracefully to the ground and glared at him as he caught his axe on its rebound. You belong here. 
Not with mortals. She pulled herself towards him and manifested her wings. Here. Silver knives flew, and her wings were riddled with holes, rendered useless. Lifeguard. My name is Naruto. Learn it. Remember it. Hate it. He pressed his fingers into his chest as he bared his teeth like a rabid beast. Because I've done the one thing few others can claim. I beat you, Valkyrie. I beat all of you. With his boast delivered, Naruto huffed and slumped against the locked doors to regain his breath. Ganilla watched him with a scowl. So long as the security was still active, he would be trapped. The Einar Jar would recover soon enough, and even she would reform whole if given enough time. Then they could attack while he was weak and make him eat those words. A raven flew down from the upper floors and landed on the handle of the door Naruto leaned upon. Its eyes shone with power as it caught. The latch clicked. No. Gunilla balled her hands into fists. Lord Odin, why? Because he is correct. The wise voice of the Allfather rumbled. She looked up and saw the one-eyed man standing in a green polo and slacks. He looked down at her and gave her a knowing look. He's still a mortal. But Lord Odin. Fret not, Captain. The Allfather smiled. His time will come, and when it does, I will send you to collect him. Gunilla was too flustered to manage a single word. Odin lost his smile as he walked over to the mortal and clapped a hand on his shoulder, a gesture that Gunilla had seen him do many times before to the gods that he ruled over. They stared at one another before Odin cracked another small smile. This one full of nothing pleasant like the one he bore for her. I will warn you once, boy. The Allfather said lowly as he put one hand on the door. If you tell your family any of Valhalla's secrets, not even Olympus' strongest magic will protect you from my wrath. Are we understood? Yes, sir. Good. Odin's smile became warm as he pushed the door open. Live strong and die well, Naruto Hunter's son. We will meet again one day. Thank you for your benevolence, Lord Odin. Naruto mumbled, stumbling out into the Boston air without looking back. Limitations. They exist for a reason, but what that reason is no one can truly say. Some believe they are to be surpassed. Others suggest they are only meant to be reached. Everything has its limits. Moreover, everyone has a breaking point. March 12, 2008. The doors slammed shut upon his exit. Finally, the fox huffed. I'd almost forgotten how nice the sun was. Just, can I have a minute without talking? Naruto groaned as he sat down on the steps of the mansion. He buried his face into his hands. He'd been in Hotel Valhalla fighting to survive for so long that, honestly, he wasn't sure what year it was. His stomach growled and he wrapped his arms around it with a groan. It felt like barbed wire was being churned around inside his guts. Surviving off of my energies alone will not suffice. We need actual food to replenish what was lost, boy. The fox rumbled. I know. Naruto sighed. With a grimace, he got back to his feet and started shambling towards the gate. Upon getting there, he leaned himself against the iron and pushed. A gentle groan before the rattle of chains made him glare at the first obstruction that had gotten in his way. He leaned himself against the gate and closed his eyes. His head hurt like it had been beaten daily for months, it was. His stomach hurt like he hadn't eaten in weeks, he hadn't. And he was so tired, physically, mentally, and emotionally. He felt like he could sleep where he stood for years if need be. Don't you dare, the fox warned. Just climb the fence again. You make it sound so easy. Naruto grumbled, backing away and looking at the top of the gate. He took a deep breath before he made the leap to the top, hands gripping the rusted metal. The brief time he spent dangling for a few seconds felt like hours to his sore arms. With a hint of struggle, the exhausted teen hoisted himself over the gate and landed with a stumble to his knees on the other side. Naruto pushed himself to sit with his back against the gate and let his head roll back. The cool springtime air blew across his face and he stared at the faint sunny hue above the cloud-filled sky with squinted eyes. Within minutes, his eyes fell shut and his breathing started to slow. Hey, hey. The fox's bark stirred Naruto from his half-slumber. We still need food, boy. Shoe up, fox. I'm just, just gonna rest here. Only need a second. He mumbled. That plan was shot down when a vintage car horn blared, disrupting his approaching blissful state of unconsciousness. He groaned and curled up onto his side, attempting to visually display how done he was dealing with people. He covered his ears and turned away when a screech of rarely used brakes echoed through the street. The only saving grace was the warmth that suddenly filled the area, soothed his aching body. Lil nephew. Uncle Fred, go away. Naruto groaned. He just wanted to rest and forget about the past however many days he spent in Hotel Valhalla. The approaching footsteps almost made him whimper. I can't wait to hear what sort of insane reasoning you have for coming to Boston. You are in so much dirt. Oh no. Uncle Fred's hand rested on his shoulder, and he felt something cool press against his forehead. 
Weird. Normally Uncle Fred was warmer. His eyes cracked open. Uncle Fred was warmer. Uh, no. No, no, no. No. Come on, kid. You're not allowed to be sick when I'm mad at you. This is so not fair. I'm not sick. Just tired. Naruto huffed, trying to blink some more accurate vision into his eyes. The figure touching him was faintly humanoid in shape, but he couldn't make out details. He tensed when he felt something wrap around his shoulders and under his legs. Uncle Fred knew better. He wouldn't touch him like that. That meant, that meant they were coming for him again. No. No, 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 no. He just got out. He quit. Odin let him go. Were the Norse seriously that petty? Apparently so. Well, he wouldn't get taken without a fight. Let me go. He protested, throwing his all into his escape. Hey, stop. Seriously, kiddo, I'm just, whoa. Naruto didn't know what he hit, but he definitely broke it. Score one for the sleepy mortal. The damage must have been impressive, because the grip on his legs dropped. Ugh, damn it. I like those shades. Naruto threw an arm over his captor's shoulder, hooked it around their neck, and swung his legs up to nail their head with a blind kick. He missed, but the following knee caught them in the larynx. His captor wheezed, fully releasing the hold they had on the boy. Naruto dropped to his feet and scrambled away, bursting into a sprint with newfound energy. He chanced to glance over his shoulder and could only see a bright blurry blob running after him. The Valkyries? Had to be. Had to be. Sore losers. All of him. All of him. I won't go back. I won't go back. I won't go back. Naruto panted as he ran. Escape was the only thing on his mind. He had to get away. He had to get away from Boston, from the East Coast. He had to go west. He just needed some help. Fox. I need your help. I can't help, boy. The fox growled. Your body is literally tearing itself apart just to replenish our reserves. We need to get out of here. Naruto stumbled through some bushes. I need to get out of here. If I help you, we could die. The fox warned. Just do it. Naruto shouted, pushing off a tree to avoid bowling over a pair of mortals on a stroll and ran through the next crosswalk. A horn blared halfway as he crossed, and he turned to have his vision filled with the headlights of a Peterbilt. Then, all he saw was a bright red light. His whole body felt like it was on fire, and his chest started to feel tight. The approaching semi-truck, and the world around him slowed to a crawl. Ten seconds, boy. The fox rumbled. Go. Naruto moved. Come on, little nephew, just stop running. You're hallucinating. Apollo called as he ran after Naruto. He grimaced when a teen kept muttering to himself. He should have recognized the signs of trauma when he parked his ride, but he was so caught up in relief that he found his nephew first. That he could get Diana off of his back and bring Artemis back out. Diana had made good on her word, almost ending his immortal life six times during the first month of his nephew's second disappearance. She had made her attempts on his immortal life more sporadic and unpredictable since the last failed attempt. Worst of all, his twin was unreachable telepathically, which meant for all intents and purposes, Apollo was on his own. For the past three months, the Roman had been awake, attending meetings in Artemis' stead and likeness, undetected by the council, or her presence was ignored. That was even more frightening to the sun god, for it implied the other Olympians knew what had happened, and were leaving him to the wolf. If that was the case, then she had been playing the long game, the shrewd bitch, with only Apollo's word being the one against her. Given the mistake he made, yet again, not many were going to take his accusation with any grain of salt. This is not going to make that any better, Apollo thought grimly as he raced across Boston streets in pursuit of Naruto, losing sight of him for milliseconds whenever he abruptly juked through the magical city that his pantheon agreed, for the most part, to stay out of. He couldn't tap into his full power here, not unless he wanted to risk drawing out his irate Roman twin and her hunters. That was too dangerous right now, for both himself, Naruto, and Naruto's psyche. His nephew's mortal mind had clearly been tortured by the Norse's barbaric afterlife, and his still living body showed the effects of the strain being in it left on him. As if being involved with that Egyptian wasn't bad enough. He grumbled, ducking around a happy elderly couple that were walking their Pomeranian. There was one positive, he would admit. His mortal nephew's speed had immensely increased. Not to godly levels, but they were definitely considered beyond current human capabilities, perhaps superhuman. It only became supernatural when Naruto suddenly exploded with a shroud of bubbling red energy and launched himself through the incoming Peterbilt, vanishing with a sonic boom. Apollo jogged to a stop as the boom rippled through the city, hardly winded from the brisk sprint that would have left Usain Bolt out of breath, and looked at the bisected Peterbilt that suffered from his nephew's spontaneous combustion. The grill, along with being busted inward, was melted and red-hot. He looked down at the patch of smoldering asphalt where he last saw his nephew, the crosswalk, and a good portion of the street now obscured by a small crater with smoke wafting off of it. 
Okay. Apollo pulled his phone out and flipped it open. Time to call Diana. No need. No matter what his lying Roman little sister might say, Apollo did not jump. He calmly turned around and found Diana standing there. Her eyes were locked in the direction Naruto had gone. I will retrieve my son. Your aid is no longer required. What? She had to be kidding. Diana, he? Must I repeat myself? Diana glanced at him. She had her bow in her hand. Go tell father that I will be unavailable for the next few days. My chariot schedule is set, and my hunters have their targets, so he should have nothing to be concerned with. Zeus won't. Apollo. The goddess looked at him with cool silver eyes. My son needs me. That right, there was all Apollo needed to hear. All right. Just here. He twisted his wrist and gave her an emergency medical bag that he pulled out of the air. She took it and tucked it away. He was in rough shape. Delirious, too. He broke my sunglasses. Keep better care of your things. Diana suggested coolly before disappearing from view. Apollo crossed his arms and looked back at the crater. Then at the mortals around him. He smirked and with a thought, was clad in a form-fitted black suit, his hair slicked back and his eyes covered by new black sunglasses. Everyone relax. He stepped into the front of the crowd and manifested an identification badge and a golden neuralizer. Both he held up. My name is Agent I. And I'm with the Federal Body Inspectors. We're taking over this investigation, but first I just need everyone to look right here. He pocketed his fake ID and pointed at the neuralizer. Get nice and close now. Be sure to look right at the pretty light. When the red haze lifted, Naruto found himself far away from Boston. Actually, he didn't know where he was. Stars and galaxies danced around the wooden path he stumbled into. A thick mist-lined stone paved ground that he didn't see until he had dropped to his hands and knees through it. His breaths came at a rapid pace, and his heart pounded like a drum. Get up, boy. Get up. The fox snarled. We cannot stay here. Naruto tried to rise, but dropped back into the mist with a heavy grunt. For as much as he wanted to leave, as willing as his spirit was, his body just wouldn't listen. His exhaustion returned tenfold and his eyes began to drift shut. Well, well, well. The soft clap of steps along the stones was accompanied by a gentle hiss of a coup. What have we here? Blue eyes cracked open and stared at the being that spoke. Their skin paler than snow and their eyes that of a serpent's, a dark-haired humanoid. Their features were too androgynous to identify their sex. Wearing a kimono and obi knelt in front of him. A grin spread across their face. My, my, my. You've certainly seen much better days, they said with a chuckle. Their pale hand, warmer than ice but not by much, reached out and cupped his face. The familiar gesture was lost on him, but there was a joy in their sinister-looking eyes. It's been so long, Naruto-kun. The world went dark before Naruto could press them for any questions. When Naruto awoke, he felt weak. It was almost as if he'd been captured by the Amazons again. Only this time his eyes didn't open under blinding fluorescent light, but soothing dances of fire. Particularly, the fire of a paper lantern which hung from a dark oak ceiling. He tried to rise, but the warmer-than-ice touch pushed onto his chest, keeping him flat. The serpent's eyes stared down at him again. Stay put. They reached out of his line of sight for something. A steaming cup was pulled into view and was offered to him. Here, small sips. Naruto glared at it warily. They chuckled. Your suspicion, though expected, is heartbreaking, my friend. I don't, he rasped, swallowing dry air in an effort to wet his mouth. No, you. Really? The serpent's eyes blinked as they pulled the drink back, but the small smile remained in place. Naruto gave a brief, curt nod that made the pounding in his head return. Ah. Uh. They set the cup down on a tray near the side of the mat he lay on, and their hands rested on their lap. Then allow me to reintroduce myself to you. My name is Yamatano Orochimaru. A phantom chill washed down Naruto's spine. Yes, there it is. The serpent, Orochimaru, let out a bitter chuckle. The familiarity. The fear. I'm... Not afraid of you. Naruto spat, scowling at the humanoid. Is that so? Orochimaru tilted their head. Naruto nodded. A massive white dragon head replaced their body. Around it were seven smaller heads. All were shaped like various reptiles, real or not. Naruto's heart raced, and his breathing increased. His body trembled against his will. The dragon's golden eye peered at him, and its tongue flicked out as it hissed. And now, change back. Please change back. Please, oh please, change back. He didn't voice the request, but it was made all the same. He felt his eyes burn as his mental capabilities regressed, subjugated to the primal fear he felt. He wanted to get away from it, he wanted to kill it, but it had him trapped, he couldn't breath so much as move. He wanted his uncle, moreover, he wanted his mom. He wanted to be away from it. I figured as such. The eight-headed dragon chuckled and mercifully its form melted away to once more appear humanoid. 
They grabbed a pad of paper, a stick of sharpened charcoal that rested beside the steaming cup. That was quite the extreme reaction from you, Nuryokun. Is it a phobia? I'll take your silence as a yes. The charcoal danced on the page. Subject suffers from extreme herpetophobia. Advise against shifting or using summoning ninjutsu unless absolutely necessary. What? Naruto croaked out. What do you want? Want? Orochimaru looked up from their notepad. They smiled at him again. Silly boy, I want to help you. Liar. Oh, Naruto-kun. Orochimaru put a hand to their chest. That cuts deep. As one shinobi of the leaf to another, I genuinely wish to aid you. The fox roared in animalistic fury, and Naruto's pounding headache increased tenfold. His brow furrowed around his wince. What the heck was a shinobi? Orochimaru's eyes widened as their silence stretched on to an uncomfortable length, and their smile faltered. They leaned in, close to his face, and looked at him again. Then, after they pulled away, they grabbed the hem of his shirt and lifted it to look at his stomach. Their other hand started to poke and prod at his stomach. Alarms blared in his head from the action. His uncle's warnings on stranger danger rushed to the forefront of his mind. Thankfully, the invasive investigation ended just as abruptly as it started. My word. Orochimaru breathed as they sat back. You're from much earlier than I anticipated. They leaned forward. Tell me, Naruto Kuen, how is Kushinaheim? Who? She's dead. The fox snorted. Good riddance. Interesting. The dragon human scribbled something down before Orochimaru retrieved the now cooled cup, and their hand ignited with blue energy. The cup steamed, and the blue light faded from view. Sip. It will help you recover. Still on edge, Naruto carefully sipped from the cup. Warm green tea flowed into his mouth and he felt his aches dwindle. Instinctively, he rushed to drink more, but was pulled back. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Drinking too fast prevents the saliva in your mouth from combating the dangerous acids in your stomach. Orochimaru chided. Naruto scowled. He didn't want a lesson on proper nutrition. He wanted to drink the tea. Orochimaru smiled back at him. If you behave, I will answer all of your questions. Reluctantly, Naruto listened. Five minutes later, he finished the cup of tea. Orochimaru helped him sit up against the wall before they recovered their notepad and charcoal pen. Where am I? My home. Orochimaru chuckled when he glared at them. I'm sorry, the opportunity was too good to pass up. They made several gestures with their hands, the blue light returning before a plume of smoke filled the space between them. It was filled with the image of a vast colorless rainbow of stars and galaxies. Naruto stared, dumbfounded, at the impossible sight before him. You are currently in the space between spaces, the beginning and the end of time itself. A place where man will never breathe, but life will always thrive. Where one need not speak in order to say something, and where the deaf can hear everything. Orochimaru smirked. I call it the paradox. That's pretty on the nose. Naruto frowned as the projected image, and the smoke it resided in dissipated. Yes, I thought so at first. They shrugged. It was a placeholder, but it's grown on me. How did I get here? You utilize the chakra of the Kyubi no Kitsune while suffering chakra exhaustion and having underdeveloped chakra coils. They stroked their chin thoughtfully. A feat I thought impossible, but here we are. Okay, so what's chakra? Ah, uh, isn't that the question? Orochimaru smiled as they held their hand up and made the blue energy flow around it again. Chakra is considered to be the essence of mortal life. Scientifically speaking, it is the energy composed of and created by the spiritual, mental, and physical capabilities of the user. It flows through all of life, or at least, it did once. What do you mean? Naruto frowned. Orochimaru grinned, eyes gleaming with pride at the question. So inquisitive. How refreshing. It almost makes me melancholy, they said. They leaned forward and pointed at him. You, Naruto, are an anomaly in the world. One of millions. Like me, you have the potential to rule over life and death. The power to command the elements and reshape reality itself resides within you. Augmented and empowered by the bane of our village, a beast composed entirely of chakra, the QB no Kitsu and Kurama, I will slaughter and skin this useless reptile. It has no right to use my name. The fox spat. Naruto glanced at Skull's exposed head as its eye looked at him and narrowed. A snarl echoed in his head. And before you get any ideas, neither do you, boy. My word, that's him, isn't it? He's speaking to you and emoting through that image. Orochimaru was staring at his tattoo. Without asking, they grabbed his arm and pushed the sleeve of his shirt up. These markings are Nordic, I believe. And even the image itself consists of minuscule characters. Chakra imbued magic? Or could it be magic imbued chakra? Fascinating. Let go of me. Naruto growled. Orochimaru looked at him, cool serpentine gaze sending shivers up Naruto's spine 
before they chuckled and released him. My apologies, old friend. So much has changed. We're not friends. I don't even know who you are. Blue eyes narrowed, recalling the unsettling form revealed to him. Why do you keep calling me one? Not now, no, but in my time we were allied. Orochimaru sighed, tapping their charcoal on their notepad. They scribbled for a second before setting the pad down. As for how that is, you must understand, Naruto Kuin, I am not limited to the same linear perception of time as you are. Long before you were even a thought in your parents' minds, I had started my experiments. Oh gods, his eyes widened. You're not a dragon. You're a scientist. Yes, Orochimaru said, sounding way too happy with his horrified realization. That was far worse, in Naruto's opinion. Magic sucked, but it had rules. Science, mortal science especially, broke those rules for the greater good. A familiar tug of fear gripped his heart, and he looked at the cup that was set aside warily. I did nothing to you, Nurokun. Orochimaru put a hand on their chest. You have my word. Forgive me if I don't believe you. With ease and understanding, Orochimaru smiled. For you've forgiven me for much worse. Stop talking about me like you know me. Naruto shot to his feet in outrage, before slumping back as his head spun. Orochimaru rose and guided him back to a seated position. He glared at them. We are not friends. Then we must be enemies? Quite the fatalistic mindset, boy. Orochimaru tisked and went to a small fire pit nearby. The pot hanging above it bubbled and was stirred. Their eyes glanced back at him, their smile cold and unfeeling like the creature it was beneath their human guise. If you want to fight me to slay the great Yamata Noroki, then you are welcome to try. You would fail at best, and at worst trap yourself in the paradox. You're a monster. Naruto narrowed his eyes further with the accusation. You threw away your humanity out of vanity. You know not of what you speak. I gave up my mortality out of fear. Orochimaru hissed back, glaring daggers at him. The fire's light illuminated their true form in their shadow. They turned back to their stirring with a sigh. If I must suffer you being so petulant and stupid, yet again, then I am indeed damned. I would rather we speak as friendly associates, if not cordial individuals. Is that too much to ask, Naruto Kuan? I guess not. Naruto muttered bringing his knees up and resting his arms atop them. He watched the scientist warily. A pressing curiosity made itself known. How did you know me? Orochimaru stopped stirring. He hung his head and spoke lowly. You were a cursed boy, born on the night of the QB's disastrous rampage, and both of your parents died to save you from its wrath. Kill it. The fox growled. I'm going to kill it. Quiet. He grunted lowly, listening transfixed as Orochimaru continued, undisturbed. You were the Jinchuriki of the QB, no kit soon. An orphan with the brain cells of a gnat, made to be the weapon to end all weapons in our era of war. At one point, I was your enemy. Orochimaru looked at him, features cold as stone. When you were twelve, I attacked you numerous times. I poisoned your best friend, and killed the man you considered a grandfather, the man I considered my father, who betrayed me and chose your father to lead the village once he stepped down. Naruto stared at him, frowning. None of this registered for him on any level. He'd only ever known the hunt and Uncle Fred as his family. If the scientist was trying to goad him into reacting, it wasn't going to happen. Then Kagaya came. They sighed. Our greatest enemy was not of our world, but the cause of it. She was the progenitor of Chakra, a being from another world. I'm sorry, hang on. Naruto closed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose. Are you suggesting that we're descended from aliens? Seriously, it's that, or she was a god. Orochimaru scoffed at the notion. You believe in magic, but not gods? Naruto arched his brow. The arts of Arcana are just something that I've yet to deconstruct on a mortal level. It's a work in progress. They shrugged. But gods? Fey. They are just advanced life forms with understanding of science that surpass our own. That's not true. And how would you know, child? Orochimaru asked, a placating smile on their face. I was raised by Artemis and Apollo. I'm sorry, what? The bewildered look that crossed Orochimaru's face was one Naruto etched into his memory. Serve the smug snake, right? My mother Artemis found my birth mother dying in a field. Naruto frowned. She and two hunters helped bring me into the world. My mother was riddled with cuts and held on long enough to give me my name. Afterward, I was raised by the huntress and her handmaidens. Her twin, Apollo, the god of the sun, often took me for lessons on culture around the world. When I was freshly turned twelve, I was told to leave with my uncle. He set me up in Pennsylvania, where I remained for two years. Please continue, Orochimaru implored, a hungry look on their face, before they shook their head. No, wait. First, the meal. You must be starving. As if on cue, 
Naruto's stomach rumbled. He begrudgingly accepted the bowl that was given to him and examined the contents. Boiled water and vegetables. Yum. I'd be more concerned with a meal if there was meat in it. The fox grumbled. Naruto shivered at the thought and started to eat. When he finished, he set the bowl down and watched Orochimaru as he ate. Uh, not that I'm not grateful for your help, but I need to know. After I tell you this story, will you want me to get home? Of course. Orochimaru smiled crookedly. It would be disastrous if you stayed or remembered this anyway. Naruto's eyes narrowed. What does that mean? Oh, well, there can only be one inhabitant of the paradox. For if it isn't witnessed, how can it exist? They tilted their head. And yet, if there were two witnesses, they would confirm its existence, thus making it impossible to not exist. Henceforth, the only way to keep it around is with one dedicated mad being within it, in essence, me, right? So, Orochimaru smiled and clapped their hands together. Oh, you were telling me about Pennsylvania? March 15, 2008. Diana hadn't expected this hunt to last for as long as it did, and if she'd known it had last three days, she would have shot Apollo with another arrow. The brief glimpse of her son in Boston had been both a blessing and a curse. That he still lived, that he survived, the tortures of Alhalla made her pride and joy as a mother swell. Artemis may have spent most of their time with him, but Diana had taught him the skills needed to survive the most extreme conditions he could find himself in. For instance, her lesser persona had not been pleased to come around with her seven-year-old son digging a hole on his own in the midst of a Nebraska blizzard. It was insulting to Diana's pride that Artemis had thought she'd let anything as simple as hypothermia harm their son. That argument cost her. It was years before Diana saw him with her own eyes again, the day before he was to be sent away. Pride in her child's survival aside, the evidence of his time spent there was painfully obvious, even before Apollo's ill-fated chase began. His features had been gaunt and his breathing was heavy, almost labored, as if he'd been on the brink of death. She assumed that given he was fighting for survival in what was considered a warrior's ideal afterlife, the second fact hadn't been too surprising. Now he'd slipped away again. Diana's eyes narrowed in annoyance as she scoured the lands beneath her chariot. If that Egyptian cur had interfered with her son once more, she would take the matter to Jupiter and end this farce of an issue. Unlike Zeus, he had the sense to recognize the potential benefits her mortal child had and would act to defend their claim on him. The Roman king of Olympus would likely even push to have the boy enlisted at Camp Jupiter. If that happened, perhaps her hunt could finally have some legitimate representation in the Senate. Stupid sexist old fools who cling to the past. Diana scowled. While she would rather have him at her side to hunt, forever out of the reach of Venus' twisted schemes, she knew Jupiter would not budge on that regard. He may have more sense than Zeus when it came to her son, but he was still a stickler about rules. A glimmer of red light caught Diana's sharp eye as she approached the Rocky Mountains. She peered over her chariot's edge, catching a glimpse of faint white darting into the dark wood. She looked at her golden deer and rose to her full height. Continue your flight. Return to Olympus once you finish. With her instructions given, Diana leapt from her chariot and descended to the vast wooded lands near Colorado Springs. The Garden of the Gods, a favorite location of her hunters to rest at and near her own private lands. Her senses alerted her to the feeling of eyes upon her. She scanned the area. Animals, mostly, with a sparse few nymphs poking their heads out to determine who she was. Confident that there was no threat, she strode toward the space where she saw the red light. Ambient energies of an unknown origin lingered over the glass dirt, and smaller glass spaces moved away from the large crater. Almost like tracks Diana realized. Her wayward son had left a trail with his oddly formed footsteps. She tried not to rush after them, willing herself to hold back from breaking into a sprint. If she chased him like a wolf did the golden hind, it would only make him flee. So, patiently, the huntress continued her pursuit through the woods. Several meters from the glass crater, the glass tracks ceased. Diana resorted to more practice tracking tactics. Eyes flicking to each cracked stick, disturbed bush and flora. Finally, after what felt like forever, she found him. Naruto was slumped against a tree, his clothing in tatters, apparently asleep. Diana observed him for a moment, before cautiously making her approach. He looked older with a growth of peach-colored facial hair that spread across his jawline and framed the sides of his mouth. Faint dark circles surrounded his eyes, and his parted lips showed a hint of sharper canines. A glimmer drew her eyes to his left ear. There was a piercing in the lobe, below the odd cuff that was his axe's disguised form, a simple black stud. Radiating from it was the same ambient energy that surrounded the glass crater he'd apparently left in his wake. She scowled at his new accessory, disliking the radiant energy on principle. Its presence raised too many questions, and knowing that there was only one way to receive answers, she decided to rouse him. A swift kick to the sole of his foot did the trick. He shot to his feet, a silver-throwing knife drawn in his right hand, and prepared to attack, only to stop when he saw it was her. Mom, Naruto, 
Diana frowned as she considered her next words. She had barely blinked, and he had moved, his arms suddenly around her, and his face buried in her shoulder. I'm sorry. The raspy whisper was accompanied by a sharp intake of breath. I'm so, so sorry. A shudder racked his form, and Diana immediately understood. Though he was her son, raised and trained by herself, her lesser persona, and their oafish twin brother, Naruto was still but a mortal boy. The trials he'd gone through, the things he must have seen because of those inferior gods, were an assault on his peace of mind. He lacked the demigod's instincts that would grant them reprieve of any brushes with death from the supernatural or ignore any unexplained phenomena. Unbidden, her arms rose up and wrapped around him. She gently rubbed his back as he uttered hushed apologies through his sobs. Reluctantly, she decided that the chastising could wait. Her son needed her. Hush now, Nudo. Diana cooed in an effort to cease his sobs. She felt him relax from her ministration and granted him a gentle peck on the side of his head before hugging him again. Her next words resonated with her Greek persona's intent. It was only after they slipped out did she realize that she'd lost control and that Artemis had rested her way back. It's okay, my fearless hunter. I'm here now. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter info in description. Credits go to the story's author with details below. Don't miss out on our other content. Click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.